much. Thank you for coming out in the face of tornado warnings and everything else. You'll notice that I changed the title a little bit. I said, A Long and Winding Road with Future Challenges Ahead. And uh, I've been thinking a lot about this uh, issue of climate change since I left NSF from the standpoint of uh, uh, especially on February 2nd, the release of the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Report, uh, talking with people in the public, talking with people in the, the private sector. And what I want to do is talk to you a little bit about why this has been such an exceedingly difficult issue for scientists to understand, for scientists to grapple with, as well as for the public to try to understand. So I want to sort of cast this in a, uh, a little bit of a historical sense and then bring you up to where we are now and uh, tell you a little bit about uh, challenges ahead, things that I'm optimistic about and things that wake me up in the middle of the night. So. Uh, in the unfolding story of global ch climate change, there are five elements that play very important roles. One is scientific theory. Another is understanding of Earth processes. How do things work? Not in theory, but in practice. Long-term <coughs> observation of, of the Earth and of climate, and, if you, and that's inherent in the idea of climate change because you have to know what has been happening than models, especially mathematical models. And the last is chance, and I think that plays a very important role too. So there's a natural greenhouse effect. It keeps the Earth warmer than it would be otherwise. <coughs> and just to give you a, just a very, very, you know, this isn't even uh, high school physics. This is like fourth grade. So <laughs> if an object is bathed in visible light, light from the sun, it warms up, and you all know that. Uh, and it emits infrared light. So sunlight comes in, infrared, right, infrared light goes out. So our planet emits infrared radiation, and that is trapped by the gases in the atmosphere that are called greenhouse gases. That's because they uh, react to infrared radiation. So in the atmosphere, most of the atmosphere is made up of nitrogen. It's an inert gas. Um, it's 80% of the atmosphere, well, 78% of the atmosphere. 20% is oxygen, thank goodness. Uh, and a small percent is uh, other gases, including greenhouse gases. The most abundant greenhouse gas is water vapor. And then there's carbon dioxide, 0.03% of the atmosphere. Water vapor and carbon dioxide have been part of our atmosphere for billions of years. Uh, their presence is what is responsible for Earth being at a comfortable temperature for us, 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Without them, we would be much colder. We would be about 5 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's the natural greenhouse effect. It keeps our atmosphere warmer. So what's the problem? And the problem is the increase in the concentration of that 0.03% of the atmosphere that's carbon dioxide. So let's talk about theory first. This, I should have, usually what I do is, is uh, I leave this off and then I say, uh, who can tell me when people first proposed that CO2 was going to be a problem? In 1896, a uh, Swedish scientist, a chemist, Svante Arrhenius, hypothesized that as we burn fossil fuels, that they would accumulate in the atmosphere and that Earth's uh, temperature would rise because of this greenhouse effect. However, and so he was focused on what's on the right-hand side. He was focused on trains and, and uh, CO2 from that. We're more focused on uh, other forms of transportation and even uh, what I should have had was a plane. If any of you go on to a website where you can look at what your impact on CO2 is, you will find out very quickly that uh, you know if you have a, a three-bedroom house uh, of average size, you're pro that's probably two tons of, of carbon a year. And if you drive a, 
um, even if you drive two cars and you, you know you drive maybe like 15, 20,000 miles a year, that's about two tons of carbon. But if you fly a lot, it, it just goes like this. And last year, my burden from flying was 60 tons. Yes, more, more video conferences, right, okay. But 90% of the carbon on the surface of the Earth, 90% of the CO2 uh, on, on, on the surface, in the ocean, et cetera, almost all of it is in the form of bicarbonate ion in the ocean. And that's, it's sort of like, bicarbonate is what is in the, the glass when you dissolve an Alka-Seltzer in it. So it's a buffer. It's, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. And most of the carbon on Earth is in the ocean, and it's in the form of bicarbonate. So scientists felt that we could put all the CO2 into the atmosphere that we wanted to because it would just dissolve in the ocean. It would be a buffer, no problem. And so when Svante Arrhenius proposed this, people said pretty quickly, uh, no, it's not a problem. And they held that opinion until the 50s when an oceanographer, Roger Revelle, and his colleagues at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography used stable isotopes of carbon and radiocarbon, C14, and they showed that only a, a fraction of the CO2 went into the ocean, but that actually about half of it was accumulating in the atmosphere. And this reopened the whole issue for the potential of CO2 being a problem with respect to climate. So for 50 years, so theory said, you know, okay, uh, it could be a problem. Understanding of Earth processes at the time of the theory said no, and then later as we learned more, this, this reemerged as a problem. And so in a very famous paper in 1957, Roger Revelle, who uh, is, is unfortunately not with us anymore, but who has won every medal in, on Earth, said human beings are now carrying out a large-scale geophysical experiment of a kind that could not have happened in the past nor be reproduced in the future. Well, that was 1957. We put a lot more CO2 into the atmosphere since then, so maybe we, um, maybe we haven't reproduced it but exacerbated it. So that was, I wanted to focus on that understanding of Earth processes really it, uh, in, changes our mind about things that happen. So what Roger Revelle said is that we will never understand the potential for this being a problem unless we observe the Earth long term. So he convinced what, uh, a person who at that time was a, a young scientist, David Keeling, uh, there in the, the lower uh, right, to establish an observatory on the top of uh, Mauna Loa, uh, in, in Hawaii and to measure the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere very, very carefully. And he started in 1958 and that record uh, is probably an icon of global change in terms of, of science and it's the long-term record of CO2 at the Mauna Loa Observatory. So that's what tells us that CO2 is increasing in the atmosphere. And now there are other stations uh, in other parts of the world, they all show that same increase. And the jagged line is the actual data, and the, the black line that goes through it is an average. And why is it jagged? Because the CO2 is very much affected by plants. Plants use CO2, they take it out of the atmosphere or out of the, out of the surface of the ocean if they're ocean plants. They, make, they combine it with water and they use that to make the material that is their bodies. And so in the summertime, when plants are growing, when there's a lot of sunlight, they're taking more CO2 out of the atmosphere, so CO2 actually goes down in response to the plants. And during the winter, when the leaves fall off the trees in the northern hemisphere, the CO2 goes back up. So the jagged line is the seasonal effect of plants, and the overall record is the increase in CO2. Other gases that are greenhouse gases have increased as well. So methane is another greenhouse gas, 
uh, and it has one third of the effect of CO2. It's much in much smaller concentrations in the atmosphere. Primarily, it's increasing from agriculture, uh, rice agriculture. Uh, rice paddies are flooded with water. Uh, they use up the oxygen. They go and oxic. They give off, off CO2 uh, or give off methane. Uh, and sulfur, another uh, radiatively active gas, is a gas that tends to cool the atmosphere uh, because it reflects light off the top of the atmosphere. So there are a lot of other things going on. There are six greenhouse gases that are most important, but because there's so much CO2 in the atmosphere compared to the others, and because we're putting so much CO2 into the atmosphere, it's the one that you hear about all the time. So. Uh, just these are the only real numbers you're going to see like this. Don't panic. Um, this is the global global carbon cycle. So I've, I've said made it in terms of carbon. If you want CO2, just multiply uh, by 3.6. Uh, so 6.3 gigatons, billion tons of carbon go into the atmosphere every year from our activity. Fossil fuel, cement, aging gives off CO2. Half of that stays in the atmosphere. That's that increase that you saw. Uh, about a quarter of it goes into the ocean, and a little less than a quarter goes to land. So plants uh, take up carbon from the atmosphere, and when the leaves fall in the forest and they accumulate in the forest uh, and form soil and so forth, that takes up CO2. Um, but if we change the use of land, so we cut down long-standing carbon and we replace it by carbon that we turn over all the time, like crops, it adds carbon to the atmosphere. So that's, that's, the, basics, that's the basic arithmetic that all of us are dealing with. So I told you about theory, and I told you about understanding Earth processes. And I told you about the importance of long-term observations. And we'll come to models later, but I want to talk a little about chance. 1988 was an enormous drought and heat wave, especially we felt it in North America and in uh, the Northern Hemisphere, but it was a worldwide drought and heat wave. Uh, Central and Eastern U.S. had very severe lo losses to agriculture and related industries, losses of 40 billion in total damage, 60 billion in uh, all of the costs, including the damage worldwide, uh, between five and 10,000 deaths that were uh, heat-related or heat-stress-related. These were the headlines of major papers uh, in the U.S. And that summer, in July, on an absolutely torrid day, uh, Dr. James Hansen of NASA testified before Congress about climate. And he said, it's time to stop waffling so much and just say that the greenhouse effect is here. So chance, the, this incredible summer, when there was more data that that uh, CO2 record was there, people started talking more about it, and it was the, 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 the uh, confluence of this incredible heat wave and concern that really started the ball rolling in the US. Um, so why are we still debating? Why is this problem so difficult for scientists? So let's look at the temperature record in 1988. So uh, what I've shown, what I show you here is the temperature record in the Northern Hemisphere from 1850 when we first had a lot of thermometers recording temperature up to 1988. And each one of the little dots is the average for the year of all of the thermometers and so forth. And then the blue is the error bar on that, generated by how many thermometers there were and so forth, and the black line is the average. So in 1988, uh, Jim Hansen said, it's time to stop waffling. And other people looked at that and they said, well, okay, we see that maybe since 1950 things have been going up, but you know, it's not too dramatic. And, uh, you know, and it seemed to go up and down some, so what, it, what about variability? 
So two things were really key to a strong scientific debate as well as a public debate about this. And one was legitimate scientific uncertainty about variability. That was 100, uh, 150 years, basically, of record. And again, it echoes this need for long-term observation. And the second was legitimate uh, scientific uncertainty about the role of the sun and solar radiation and its importance compared to CO2 because there were you many of you have heard about the sunspot cycle an 11 year cycle of that affects the radiation from the sun there are other cycles uh, in solar radiation and there were legitimate concerns that it wasn't so much the CO2 as it was a variation that was maybe 10 years, maybe 30 years, you know, name your number of years in solar variability. So what happened was Congress did act on that, but what they generated was the Global Change Research Act of 1990. It established a global a program of, of investigation in the US, and it set off a doubling of research funding into the global change area. So they said, we're worried but we're not going to take action because of these legitimate uncertainties, and so we want you to go out and find out what's really happening. So we have lots of theory. They were certainly going to do studies of understanding Earth processes, but I think one of the most important things they did, and one of the most innovative things, was to start looking for other ways to get longer records of climate change and longer records of CO2. And the place that they got most of those long records that we now deal with uh, was from ice. So when uh, snow falls on glaciers or on the center of Greenland or the middle of Antarctica, and it accumulates, the snow falls, and it starts under pressure, um, the, the snow forms into ice, and it traps within the ice bubbles of air. And those, that air is the, the air that was, the, co the composition of that air is what was there at the time that it froze into the ice. And lots of, of uh, important physics and chemistry have, has been done to demonstrate that the concentration uh, doesn't, uh, it, the air doesn't bleed out, it isn't contaminated by the ice. So the bubbles in the ice are little recorders of the atmosphere of the past. And so an incredible program of drilling ice in Greenland, in Antarctica, and in glaciers around the world started. And that record, it was an extremely important one in terms of being able to say whether this was a short-term effect or a long-term effect. So we developed an impeccable set of scientific measurements of the atmosphere in the past. And those measurements showed that the greenhouse gases were increasing in the atmosphere. And the first set were me measurements that were made in Greenland. And uh, that graph goes from the year 1000 on the left to 2000 on the right. And it is a measure of the CO2 abundance in the atmosphere. So they, they also had to figure out how to get the bubbles out of the ice without contamination, make the measurements and so forth. Uh, and there, there was a good five years of methodology involved, but then some very, very interesting measurements started coming out. And as you can see, around 1800, the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere started taking off. And then that little red arrow points to a line there, and that's the measurements of CO2 from Dave Keeling, all the rest of the dots and triangles are measurements from ice. And where they were, uh, where we had both, this was another important validation of this ice method, was that they were identical. So we know that the method works and that we have this, this record. So 31% increase in CO2 over the industrial era. Uh, so this just shows that in a little more uh, detail. So a thousand year record of CO2. So we, kn we know that also that this is, one, this is one of the important things to say that the CO2 is resulting from our activity, isn't a fluke of nature. 
uh, it's associated with the, and it starts going up like that when we start burning a lot of fossil fuels. Now, there's a reason this is backwards, and that is because I tried to make all of the graphs go from old on the right to the present, I'm sorry, old on the left to the present on the right. And another set of measurements came from Antarctica. The record in Greenland is not as old as the record in Antarctica. And what this is, is not 1,000 years, this is 160,000 years on the left to the present day on the right. And the graph on the lower part with the thick white lines are the measurements of CO2 in the gas bubbles from Antarctica. And they show that over the last 160,000 years that the CO2 never went above about 300 of the units and that uh, the, the uh, let's see, I gotta, okay. And so we go back in time from present to the time of the glaciers. And this is the glacial age and this is the last interglacial. So CO2 was about what it, what it was uh, for pre-industrial times during the last interglacial, and the glacials, it was much lower. And the other important thing about this is now we're up at, we're up here in terms of CO2, and the difference between the glacial and the interglacial is about the same order of magnitude as the difference between a natural interglacial and today. So it's also, people were very interested in this as a record because the amount of change was similar. Then this graph is the inferred temperature, and this comes from the concentration of the stable isotopes of oxygen, and, uh, and it is a measure of temperature. And of course, the thing that immediately came out was the general relationship between temperature and CO2. So high, whoops, high CO2, high temperature, lower CO2, lower temperature. High CO2, high temperature. So nobody was claiming that this was a one-to-one -one relationship, but they were saying, in general, you can explain most of the variability in the temperature by the variability in CO2. There we go. And uh, this activity on Antarctica, uh, that was the first signal that we had. Uh, and in recent years, that's, that record has been extended back to uh, over 400,000 years. So this is almost half a million years. So that's 400,000 years ago on the left and present day on the right. And this is, these are the same curves that you saw before. So this is CO2, that same pattern and that's temperature. And this goes back further to more glacial and interglacial times. And each very big interglacial time was marked with very high CO2 and much warmer temperatures. So the paleoclimatologists said CO2 and temperature are closely related. It's not one to one. But in terms of big changes, at the scale of the changes that we've made, it's related. And it's also related to climate in the past, overall climate. And it also tells us, again, um, I don't, uh, the, the present day CO2 would be about here. So it gives you a sense of how big a change it is relative to anything we've seen in the last half million years. So this was an enormous effort. Uh, this was a, a contribution of the research community, and it's a way, it's a long-term observation, but it also tells us more about Earth processes. So, that brings us to saying something about the future. What's the implication of all this CO2 in the atmosphere? And how do uh, scientists make predictions about the future models. So that's the fifth element that I talked to you about that was so important in, in making, uh, these, making these understandings. So what do you have to do to know what's going on? All of the, these parts of, uh, of what we see around us 
uh, human influences, the ocean, ice, mountains, clouds, the sun, vegetation, rivers, uh, agricultural activity, all influence CO2. And they all influence climate. And so in order to make a prediction about what would happen as a result of all this CO2, scientists had to, to quantify the relationship of CO2 in all of these processes. And you don't have to know anything about this. It's just to, this is a very simplified view of sort of taking each one of those and saying it's a box. And we have to understand mathematically what's in the box. And we have to understand mathematically how it interacts with every other box there in order to make a prediction. It's one of the most challenging kinds of calculations that, that modeling uh, has for humanity. It's one of the most computer intensive calculations that we have. And so between 1990 and 2000, another important thing was, that was happening was dramatic improvements in the ability of scientists to mathematically represent all of that. Uh, some of that came from understanding things better. But a tremendous amount of it came from the explosion in the capability of computers. Uh, more than tenfold increase in computing power uh, it was actually more like a 40 percent, uh, 40 times greater uh, increase in computing power. And so compared to, to 1990 and 2000, people were actually able to include the ocean in the models. In 1990, we couldn't. We had to just sort of say, well, they called it a swamp ocean. You know, we would say the ocean was all one temperature and it didn't do anything. Um, Nowadays, they're fully coupled models that include the ocean circulating around and taking up CO2 in one place and moving it to other places. Uh, we also have other greenhouse gases in the models now, uh, like methane and, li and radiatively active gases like sulfate. One of the things we don't have is a full model of ecosystems. It's just too much for the the, uh, the computing capacity that we have. So this is a dramatic improvement, but it's also uh, a real challenge to come. So now I'd like to, so here's where, we, you know, science is marching along, desperately trying to build, put every tool that we have to a greater understanding, to reducing those valid scientific uncertainties. In the meantime, internationally, uh, people became more and more alarmed about what they were seeing in terms of the, the um, melting of glaciers and ice caps in terms of the, the uh, increase in temperature. And in 1997, uh, actually in 1996, the Kyoto Treaty uh, uh, was approved and the U.S. signed the Kyoto Treaty, which said we're all going to work to reduce greenhouse gases. The protocol is how we put the treaty into force, what we do as a result of the treaty, and that's what we didn't sign. So this was an international agreement on how the world's nations would try to address this problem. And the elements of it, the key parts of the protocol, after saying it's a problem, we should reduce greenhouse gases, which we agreed to, was that the developed world, which was responsible for most of the emissions, would cap emissions. So we would say we won't emit any more CO2 than some level. And the developed world, if we couldn't, if we had to go beyond that, we would have to buy the right to do it, sort of like buying indulgences during, the, the, uh, the, during those other time, historic times. Um, so we would buy indulgences for emissions that were over the cap by buying credits for undertaking clean development projects in the developing world. So uh, what we would do was say uh, they were going to put uh, an electric power generation uh, plant into uh, central West Africa, and instead of it being a coal burning plant, it would be a hydro plant. So you would decrease the CO2 emissions, clean development, but development. So we were 
buying the indulgences with uh, investments in the developing world. So that was the essence of the Kyoto Protocol. And, if, and the, the reaction to this uh, in the US uh, and in some of the developing world was incredible. If you want to see some of the most biting political cartoons, uh, just go on to uh, Google and Google uh, Kyoto Protocol cartoons. And it's a real, uh, <laughs> it's a real experience. This says, um, Kyotozilla across the top, wow, it's crushing Alberta's economy, trampling our jobs, flattening everything, what a great movie. And then the little politician is saying, that's not a movie. And that was the reaction to uh, Kyoto Protocol in some of the world. So during the late 1990s, it was clear that the US Senate would not ratify the protocol, even though we had ratified the treaty. And, but we were part of the process. So essentially, everybody knew we weren't going to approve it, but we never said we weren't going to approve it. So we went to all of the conferences. We argued for our position internationally. In 2001, President Bush announced that the US would not to continue to be a part of the negotiations. And so the big reaction came from that announcement that we wouldn't. And uh, then there's a whole literature of what happened internationally uh, with the response to that statement. And that also, this is another one of those chance things. So the announcement was made that we would not be part of Kyoto. And on its heels came the, uh, a very important scientific assessment of where we were in understanding global change from a UN panel. It was the third such assessment. They had, at that time, they were happening about every five years. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC. And what they do, they don't do research, they assess the results of all of the research. A very open process, uh, thousands of scientists involved, uh, heavily reviewed document, and the third assessment report, as every other report, is internationally agreed upon. So we actually have a chance to go to the table and say, you know, we don't agree with this uh, result or the way that it's stated. And it said, climate change is a big problem. So we have Kyoto with a mechanism that the US didn't like. We have the US saying, we don't like it, we're not going to play anymore. And then this report coming out. Uh, and each report has three books. One is the scientific basis. One is the impacts that are anticipated. And the third is, what do we do about it? What are the mitigation options? So this was the scientific basis for climate change. And what did it say? One, probably the most iconic figure for that, remember I said the CO2 curve going up was an icon of, of uh, global change. The icon of the third assessment was this, uh, oh my goodness, <laughs> my email is still connected here. I can win a honeymoon around the world. Uh, <laughs> more interesting than, than, than this, huh? This was the first detailed uh, temperature record uh, from the northern hemisphere. And the red is all the data from thermometers. The blue are data from, well, we won't have thermometers uh, pre, uh, before about 1850, so you have to infer the temperature from other mechanisms. And these were inferences of temperature from tree ring data, relating the, the width of the tree ring to both precipitation and temperature from the measurements in ice cores and so forth. Now, the black line is the average, and where they do overlap, they were in good agreement. The blue line is all the data, so you can see the blue goes, the average goes through there. The gray are the error bars on the data. And the reason they get really big there, uh, older than, that's 1,000 years ago on the left, 2000, year, year 2000 on the right. And the reason they get really big 
when you get back before about 1600, is the number of trees that are still living. So the statistics get worse. Uh, the variability, the, the error bars are greater. So this, but this, uh, this record with this dramatic increase in temperature at exactly the time that we were seeing that dramatic increase in CO2 came to be known as the hockey stick diagram for obvious reasons. And this was really an icon of the third assessment report. It also said that ocean temperatures showed signs of increase as well, and those are records for the Atlantic on the top, the Pacific in the middle, the Indian Ocean, and the world and from 19, about 1955 to 2000, and it was because we didn't have enough measurements of the ocean before that time. A, a t the long-term observation is really critical. But, you know, you could tell yourself that, that uh, given the, the uncertainties and everything and going up and down, that it still looked like the oceans were getting warmer as well. And this was the first time that people had gathered enough information to try to also look at some other issues like precipitation. And what got kind of cut off there on the left, that says the percent of continental U.S. with a a much above normal proportion of total annual precipitation from one day extreme events. So this was the first evidence that this climate change was also somehow associated with extreme events. Not, not hurricanes at this point, they're just talking about uh, normal extreme uh, rain events. So we saw uh, a lot of things in this report that that suggested that uh, climate change was happening. And then they made some projections, again, based on the models. And so this was a model of what the average temperature might be in 2100, uh, 100 years in the future. Uh, the red colors are warmer, uh, the blue colors are colder, and obviously there are no blue colors. Um, and it, it showed for the first, this was the first time that the, the models showed that the, the poles might warm up faster than the rest of the, the Earth. And this was suggesting uh, about three degrees centigrade, so about seven and a half, eight and a half degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, let, me, let me just back up. So we've got the hockey stick, the temperature. We've got the ocean warming. We've got more precipitation events, and we have this projection of the future. So, you know, why didn't, and, and for some people that was enough. It was, okay, it, it's upon us, and uh, Kyoto is, is moving, we've got to play. Others said, you know, what is our uncertainty here? And the, the uh, IPCC assessments use a very, very careful wording with respect to uncertainty. And they look at two things. One is statistical uncertainty. So if you can measure something, you can measure the error. You can say what's, you know, how much variability is there. Some things you couldn't measure. They were the opinion of scientists. And therefore, they had to look at what the opinion of the scientific community was about the likelihood. So they looked at uncertainty and they looked at likelihood. And one of those issues of likelihood was, is this really related to CO2? So first of all, they said that it was likely that we were in global warming. And by that, they meant that there was uh, about a 70% chance, that's what the statistics said, that this, that this signal was real. And then they said that, it, that there was only about a 50-50 chance that they could attribute that warming to CO2. So this is an extremely careful document, the, uh, a consensus document of, you know, 2,000 scientists. So in spite of these data, there was still uh, a very careful wording about this. 
And what are some of the reasons that they were still uncertain? This was uh, a climate model simulation of temperature from, again, goes to about 1860. That's when we first started recording a lot of thermometers. Uh, to, uh, in this case, it's, uh, that's to 2000 on the right, or 1999. And the black line are the observed temperatures, and the red line was the model simulation. So it's similar. It's definitely similar. But scientists were still not able to just nail it down and say, we can generate the temperature that we see with everything else that's happening plus CO2. And this was the precipitation change. Uh, and it, the blue colors are more precipitation, the yellow colors are, and orange colors are less precipitation. And so they also said there's going to be more heavier rainfall uh, or more rainfall in the tropics, and the dry regions are going to become drier. And one of the reasons that I wanted to show you this diagram is that you'll see that the model is from the Meteorological Office, the Haley Center, Hadley Center for Climate Prediction and Research. That's in UK. Another important piece was that the US did not have a strong contribution to the climate models at the time. And the reason that we didn't was that we didn't have the computer power available to the scientific community. And so another important thing, and the US was the leader in the theory of the climate models, but we weren't the leader in the execution. So this was another concern. The leading theoreticians about the models weren't in the game. So you have lots of reasons for people to express uncertainty. So in spite of all that uncertainty, you know, this was the year that we had, this was the cover of Time Magazine in April, looks like about 9th or something, 2001. Global warming, climbing temperatures, melting glaciers, rising seas all over the earth. We're feeling the heat. Why isn't Washington? And the reason was that there was so much at stake for the economy. And this, this level of uncertainty. And a Kyoto Protocol that said, the way we will address this, the way we'll absolve ourselves and buy an indulgence is by transferring money to the developing world. And who are the two biggest countries getting clean development mechanism offsets? China and India. So, there were political reasons, there were uncertainty reasons, there were timing reasons, um, there were, you know, your political philosophy versus mine. So I have no, I'm not going to express an opinion about what should have happened. What I want to tell you is what did happen and, and why I think that that happened. So 2006, other things happened. The Gore movie, An Inconvenient Truth. Love it, don't love it, it was a monumental hit. Second largest grossing documentary of all time, and what was the first? The March of the Penguins. Remember that one? <laughs> <laughs> and they learned a lot from, from that. It was, it was a revolutionary change in the thinking to be able to put out a documentary and have, you know, Millions of people pay money to see it. And uh, so that was, uh, you know, it's a, a, whether you want to say it was a chance or not a chance, it, the, the chance was that people reacted to it in that way and lots of people went. Also, about uh, last, uh, end of October of last year, uh, the culmination of a two-year effort by the former Chancellor of the Exchequer of UK, Sir Nicholas Stern, an economist, a absolute middle of the road conventional economist using the economic tools that are used by all countries to talk about their gross domestic product. He was asked by Treasury 
in UK to undertake a review of the economics of climate change, a two-year pr uh, process that came out last October. And uh, uh, so these are some of the quotes from that. Climate change threatens to be the greatest and widest ranging market failure ever seen. And what does Sir Nicholas mean by failure? He means that the market doesn't take into account all of the costs. So w our gross domestic product and our market is not based on all of the issues. So if precipitation changes as a result of climate change and uh, UK happens to be a loser, that's not incorporated into the cost of the, the uh, CO2 and other greenhouse gases. That's what he means by market failure. Our actions over the coming few decades could risk major disruption to economic and social activity. Uh, you can read as well as I do. Uh, and so he called for an investment of 1% of GDP per year to avoid costs of 20% of GDP loss in the future as a result of primarily, in this case, uh, he said that these, these uh, pieces were going to be felt in precipitation, its impact on water availability, on uh, energy use, on agriculture in UK, and so forth. It was a global model, but he really brought it back to UK. So what happened? Three Nobel Prize winning economists praised the report, called for action, said, you know, okay, we know, and an economist, one of us, <coughs> said, has done an absolute middle of the road analysis and demonstrated the cost. Many governments called for action. Other economists, including a Nobel Prize winner, challenged the discount rate set for the cost of action. And this, the discount rate is the comparison of what it costs now versus what it costs later. And inherent in Sir Nicholas' uh, analysis was he assigned a discount rate that said that it was as important to save money in the future as it was now. And not everybody accepted that as the correct uh, economic approach. Um, and in fact, most of the, the debate over this has really turned into a debate about ethics. Is it as important for us to save money as it is for future generations to save money? Or will technology buy us out of this crunch? And again, I think it's important, I, I, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to give you a value judgment on that. It's important to understand what the, the sources of these arguments and uncertainties are, aside from the politics. It's, unpor it's important to understand the uncertainties and, and, and what people are, are and, and in this case, this issue of whether technology will buy us out of the problem or not. So that was November. February 2nd, the fourth assessment of the IPCC came out. And I talked to you a little bit about that issue of uncertainty and likelihood. The fourth assessment said climate change is unequivocal. This is 2,500 scientists. For those of you who aren't scientists, I assure you that scientists are some of the most conservative people when it comes to expressing an opinion about something. I mean, just try to, get, you know, you've seen me, you know, I'm not saying anything about my opinion, right? Um, unequivocal. They mean there is no way for them to, to say that climate change is not happening. This is 99% certainty. They also said, most likely, 90% likelihood that the changes are due to human activity. Remember that, that in 2001, they said 50-50. So an incredible increase in their certainty of the relationship between CO2 and climate. Changes in the polar region are happening much more quickly than we had anticipated. We've doubled the rate of temperature increase since 2001. It was 0.1 degree centigrade per decade in 2001. It's now 0.2 degrees centigrade per decade. And 
a, 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 not a conclusion of theirs, these are conclusions of theirs, but uh, an observation that we were now above the doubling, uh, a trend that would double CO2 by the end of the, the century. We're now inching up toward a tripling of CO2 by the end of the century. So those two, un, the use of the term unequivocal to me was stunning. I mean, scientists just don't do that. Uh, so this was, uh, they were really, it, you know, people called it the smoking gun. They said, that, you know, this is it. Um, uh, but those are really stunning statements. And so let's take a look at, at some of that. And I'll just focus on the top one because it's temperature. This is the, you'll notice it's the same curve that I showed you before. What I did was I covered up uh, everything from 1988 uh, on when I talked to you about Jim Hansen to see what he was looking at. And I think it's important to always look at what people had available to them. But of course, what's happened since then is that that, that uh, temperature rise has become more certain. And this was the sense of the, the uh, uh, report that climate change was unequivocal. Uh, I'm not going to show you all of the, there, tons of, of uh, data on ice caps and on, on uh, Greenland. This is one of a series of, of figures, and it is not the most dramatic, uh, of ice caps around the world which are in major retreat. The models. For the first time, the IPCC ran models of what would happen if we uh, if we did stop emitting CO2 altogether, no more CO2. And that's the yellow curve there. Uh, so that, that's, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I said no more, no more increase in CO2. So that's constant concentrations of CO2. So we're committed to warming over what we have experienced in the last century, regardless of whether we do anything uh, to put more CO2 into the atmosphere or not. The red curve is what's called business as usual. That's the current rate of increase of CO2. So that's the temperature, the warming that we would get. And that's, that's centigrade on the left. So um, you, just for rough purposes, you could double uh, that and make it turn it into Fahrenheit. It's a little more than that. Um, the green is, uh, we do something about it, but we still allow high emissions of CO2. And the blue is uh, essentially low emissions on the, uh, using something like the Kyoto Protocol, but we still, that still has uh, increases in emissions. And one of the important things was the US was there. We had gotten tremendous new computing resources and of the approximately 17 model runs that were done, U.S. was responsible for at least half of them. So this was totally consistent with what was happening in the, the U.S. So those are just uh, similar kinds of uh, models to the one I showed you before. The middle globe that you see are the projections of surface temperatures sort of 20 years from now, 2020 to 2029. The right-hand side is the end of the century. And there are three different scenarios. The, one, the, the, um, uh, the top one uh, is low emissions. The second one is high emissions. The third one is business as usual with no attempt to decrease CO2. And those, uh, those temperatures, the, the red colors, are basically uh, temperatures that are increases of uh, about uh, four degrees Fahrenheit, about two degrees centigrade. So about four, three and a half degrees uh, in the low emission scenario, somewhere between seven and eight degrees in, in the high emission scenario. So there wasn't much there to, to be happy about in terms of uh, what the future will, will hold. And basically, they said, we're committed to further temperature increases, regardless of whose model we're looking at and regardless of why it happened uh, with these scenarios. <coughs> 
as well as precipitation changes, and this is a little bit different than the diagram that I showed you before. The, the brown are decreases in precipitation in the dry areas, increases in the tropics, uh, and increases in the high latitudes. So what, what do we not know in this world that's so aware of climate change? You know, what, what are the uncertainties? I don't think there are uncertainties in whether climate is changing. I don't think there are uncertainties in whether it's due to CO2. However, we're very aware of sea level, and you are very aware of sea level, and that is related to the heating of the ocean altogether and the melting of ice on land. Ice, ice shelves, ice that's floating in the ocean doesn't matter. It's already at equilibrium. It's not going to change sea level. But Greenland and Antarctica will. And understanding and modeling ice sheet dynamics is one of the most challenging aspects of climate models. And so, so much so that the IPCC wouldn't make an estimate of what the sea level rise would be. And they were castigated for this. But they said, we don't understand the dynamics well enough. Uh, it's very complicated. It's not only the, the uh, melting, but it's the lubrication of the ice sheet at the base. Because if it's well lubricated with water, it slips, easily, it slips more easily, and it can melt faster. And so today, that, that's a, a, a map from satellite data of the rate of change in the height of the ice cap on Greenland. And everything in blue is decrease in height. So you see all around the margins, the ice cap is decreasing in height very rapidly. However, in the middle, it's actually getting higher. So this is one of the big uncertainties. We, we see in all of the small glaciers, they're all melting. But there's this uncertainty about what's happening in Greenland. So this is a, a big uncertainty for the future. Second issue is they said in the report that they were concerned about surprises. And what did they mean by surprises? They meant that changes that we couldn't predict from just the linear, you know, if you just extrapolate out with the current rate of change. And one of the key ones of that uh, is related to the deep circulation of the oceans. It's abs the oceans are, they're sort of the regulator on climate. They're huge. They're 70% of the surface. They're, they're, although there are changes, there are differences in temperature, most of the ocean is, is uh, the deep ocean is just above freezing. It is a powerful regulator of climate. Uh, but we know from paleoclimate that it's very sensitive to change. And the spaghetti on there, the red are the surface uh, circulation, the blue is the deep water circulation, and that big stirring from top to bottom is one of the most important pieces of the climate record. And it's also one of the ones that we, we don't understand very well. It's driven by the fact that at high latitudes, the water is very cold. And you freeze the surface. And what happens when you free, uh, freeze salt water? The ice is fresher, and what's left behind is saltier. And it's denser. Cold water is denser. So you have saltier water generated by freezing, and it's cold. So it sinks. And that's why a lot of the sinking takes place uh, up in the North Atlantic and around Antarctica. And that sinking contributes to this big overturn of the ocean and a very powerful climate regulator. Well, what's happening in the area? So that's, if you, if you can't tell, that's North America and Labrador. And uh, wait, I've got the thing here. OK, so here's North America. There's Labrador. There's the tip of, of Greenland. And each one of these is a map. And they go from 1960 up to 1995. And they are from measurements. Uh, and, they, and this is a map of how fresh or salty the water is. 
and the brown colors are saltier, and the green colors less salty, and the blue colors are very fresh. So what is happening is uh, a 40-year, 50-year change in the saltiness of the waters in this area in which the big conveyor is generated. Now, we don't have measurements before there, so we don't know whether this is part of a climate uh, cycle or whether this is something very unusual. It doesn't matter what the cause is for right now. It matters whether this is indicative of a big potential for a big surprise, a change in the circulation of the ocean. And so I don't want, I'm not trying to scare you with that. I'm just trying to say it's, it's a measure of our uncertainty, and it's a measure of that sense of there might be surprises out there that we can't predict for you yet. And so what should we be doing in the future? We should certainly be understanding what's going on there. We should certainly be looking for other tools, like, like we did with the ice cores, to project the CO2 into the past to find out what's happened in the past. Uh, and we should certainly be understanding where uh, the climate is very sensitive to maybe changing rapidly. Try to give you a better sense of where there would be surprises. Climate change impacts in terms of health and agriculture and forest and, and sea level and whatever. Another area where we're not doing very well yet because, because legitimately people have been focused on trying to understand physically what's going on. So certainly the impact of ocean warming as a whole, glacial melt on sea level is a formidable challenge. Those are, the red areas are ones that would uh, be submerged with a 1.5 meter sea level rise. That is what is projected by some models for the end of this century. But again, remember the IPCC didn't say how much sea level would rise because they said we don't know it well enough. Some models suggest that it would be a meter and a half. Uh, drought, uh, another climate change impact. Many of you may have, have seen records of, from Washington State of the infestation of pine bark beetles. Um, the red uh, is the number of acres of uh, infestation. The blue is the precip precipitation regime. And so in general, the, the uh, infestation gets bigger during drier times and less uh, and, and, uh, and uh, uh, is less important during uh, wetter times. And that's because of the stress on the trees, not, not because the beetle likes wet weather or something, it's the stress on the trees. Uh, but what happens there in terms of, of uh, infestations of this sort, were very difficult for us to, to uh, talk about. One last slide. Uh, so those are things that I worry about. Okay, what gives me optimism for the future? Last year, California enacted legislation, Assembly Bill 32, calling for a cap to greenhouse gas emissions in California. Uh, just as they did with gasoline, uh, cleanliness of clean burning gasoline, with, with um, uh, mileage standards for cars, they are way out there in front in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, regional greenhouse gas initiative in New England and mid-Atlantic states will cap greenhouse gas emissions for power companies. Um, a group of 10 of the largest U.S. corporations has joined two of the largest uh, environmental NGOs, the National Resource Defense Council and Environmental Defense, calling on Congress for a cap and trade system. So this is the private sector working through legislation to argue for a mechanism for them to adapt. And a cap and trade is modeled on a very successful cap and trade system that was enacted for nitrate and sulfate emissions. And so essentially it's that sense of you know, providing an impetus 
to change by, by capping the emissions, but also allowing companies to react at the speed that they are able and in whatever they feel is the most appropriate way for them to get to the cap. And so one of the things that has made me feel uh, as though uh, not only are, are the scientists working very hard, but I think the private sector is now also trying to take precautionary um, measures, whether or not they, even if they say, you know, this whole CO2 thing is, um, you know, let's say it's a 50-year blip. Uh, related to something else. We're still going to have to deal with it for 50 years. And so this is, this is a way to respond. Six international corporations have said that they will become carbon neutral. That is, they will uh, offset anything that they can't, um, that uh, they'll have no net carbon dioxide emissions by 21. Many of you heard that Branson Airlines has announced a $25,000 prize to a group that can successfully remove a billion tons of CO2 from the atmosphere every year uh, for 10 years. Um, so the, this whole area is being stimulated in the private sector, and I think that that's really good. So I'll end there saying I think that there's a lot of reason for optimism about this. I see a lot of activity on the part of the business community. I see the scientific community focused on what they are some of the, the most challenging issues. And uh, this is uh, Aldo Leopold's wonderful quote, the first rule of intelligent tinkering is to save all the pieces. Thank you. <laughs>
in regards to the human impact of global warming on people who live in the southern hemisphere, uh -huh. particularly those who live in sub Sahel Africa, we hear so little of that part of the world and what the effects there might be. Would you speak to that? Uh, the uh, slides that I showed you from both 2001 and 2007 uh, show further drying in that area. So the, the, sub, the Sahel is the big boundary between the Sahara and the tropics. And so all of our models show further drying of the Sahel. That doesn't mean that you know, every year will progressively dry more and more. There will still be all kinds of, of uh, you know, year by year variation on this, but all of the trends show further drying of that area. Uh, the big concern is that, uh, number one, uh, the area is under uh, exceeding stress from deforestation and from agriculture because of the, you know, the population. Um, number two, uh, there are not a lot of resources on the parts of those countries to develop um, other mechanisms to, to bring water from other, other sources. Uh, and number three, the, the, the um, uh, political tensions in the areas are extreme. And those are, um, there, people are very concerned about uh, the, the impact of that. This country will, uh, we are an extraordinarily innovative, resilient, robust, and wealthy country. When climate change comes, I have great faith in the ability of the, the, both the science minds, the, the uh, business minds, uh, everybody in this country being able to deal with this. That is not the case for all of the world. There's one in the back there. Uh, Frank Greskovich, uh, if we consider the Earth as a planet that's constantly in evolution, second is, do you consider the signs that predicted the Ice Age to be faulty? Third, how do you explain the dinosaur era when the temperatures were markedly increased and human beings had no cause in that factor? Okay. Uh, okay. Let's uh, certainly it's a the the globe is a very complicated system. You're right. We have to look at it as, as a system. So what about this prediction? Uh, it, when I was in graduate school, I, I very clearly remember a New Yorker cartoon. It was two guys in a bar. And uh, one said to the other, so um, uh, in the future, they're going to ask you what you did with your interglacial. In other words, we're going into a glacial, and so you know, what did we do? Uh, and uh, and there was a lot of thinking about that. Okay, what has happened subsequently? Number one, we didn't have the, that long record of CO2. Remember, it started in '57, and these those that was the thinking in 1970 to 70. 75. So we only had 15 years of that record. Number two, uh, we did not have any of the ice core data that showed the relationship between CO2 and temperature. All we had was the, the fact that, in fact, most people uh, totally associated the glaciations with incoming radiation. They were related to you know, the, the, the nature of Earth's orbit, and that was the theory of what controlled glacials and interglacials. There's a lot that's been done now that, that looks at these issues of CO2 and the ecosystem itself. So that's, they, they were fine interpretations for the time based on what our understanding of Earth processes was. Uh, number three, what about the dinosaurs? And uh, you know, we there, yes, you're absolutely right. The CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere at that time were substantially uh, at well, depends on what part of it. Dinosaurs were around for about uh, 200 million years, and uh, during that time, uh, CO2 probably varied by a factor of two to four. What was different? 
Regardless of what happens, I assure you that the Earth will remain as a system. Plants will continue to grow. There will be animals around. I mean, this isn't going to, you know, we don't, we don't just drop off a cliff. But we were not invested in the amount of physical infrastructure that we have. Well, we weren't around, number one. We have never lived in uh, a, a, a world with this level of CO2. Uh, we, have, we have a lot of very expensive infrastructure that we depend on. And we depend on agriculture. And if you change the precipitation and the temperature such that the best place to grow corn is in the Northwest Territories, I guarantee you, you won't be doing it because the soil is not thick enough and the soil doesn't have enough organic material. So we are in part dependent on the places that we have that we can do things as well as the temperature and the precipitation. So it's where our vulnerability is intimately tied to what we have developed for ourselves, our, our incredible capability of engineering the landscape and engineering what's around us. Um, there, there isn't a lot, you know, if, if uh, we have very substantial, uh, I'll give you another, uh, one, one of my favorite examples. Right now, water managers in the West manage to extremes. They manage for the big floods, they manage for the droughts, but the one uniform piece is they count on the snowpack storing water in snow at altitude during the winter and delivering it in the spring when agriculture needs it by melt and runoff. There isn't enough space to, in, in reservoirs to save all of that water if it doesn't stay in the, the high altitudes as snow and it just runs off during the winter. It's not there in the spring when we need it. So that's a natural service, an ecosystem service. If we change precipitation so we don't have as much of it, if we melt the snowpack, if we don't have the snow there during the winter, we have to find other ways to, to irrigate the West. And if you've flown over it, you see all that center primitive irrigation. And that's why we're vulnerable. And so my argument is it doesn't matter a whit what happened to the tyrannosaurs and the stegosaurs and all of those other charismatic beasts. It matters what happens to us. <laughs> Two more questions. Okay. Go ahead. Sorry to give such long answers. I'm preventing you from I have two I'll questions. I hope it's OK to ask both of them. The first one is, I think, rather simple. You referred to the fact that on the large land masses, such as in the Antarctic and in Greenland, it's around the edges that we're having the melt. And in the center, we're having, actually having a buildup. In Greenland, yes. Uh, doesn't that, though, that build up in the center imply global warming as well, in this, if I have this right, that in order to have a lot more snow, you have to have a warming. You have to have it, it has to be warm enough to snow. My other question is, are you familiar with the work of, with the publication of the skeptical environmentalist by Bjorn Lomborg, who mm -hmm. confutes every piece of data you've shown here, I think, and who draws the exact opposite conclusions that I think you, who have been rather noncommittal, have actually led us to. Um, and, and so could you comment on uh, Lomborg's book? Sure. Um, so I'm sorry, the first, the, okay, right. Uh, it's not so much that, that it, it can't be too cold. You have to have enough moisture. The buildup is dependent on moisture. And one of the things you saw in all of the models was more precipitation at high latitude. And so those who, you know, there's a, uh, the more precipitation 
high latitude plus also the altitude of the glaciers equals more snow. So it, the question is the balance. So there's a good explanation for why the, there's more snow developing there. There's also a good explanation for why it's, it's uh, um, melting at the edges. The question is, what's the balance? And that we just don't understand well enough. OK. Uh, yes, the, the skeptical environmentalists. Um, several things. Um, One of the, uh, uh, his book was written before the last IPCC report. And so, like State of Fear, it is primarily based on the uncertainties that were uh, out there for 2001. And uh, one of those, uh, a major uncertainty, was in the quality of the models. And so much of his, uh, uh, information about how he projects the change is based on the models of the past. Second is, and this was also an argument from uh, a State of Fear, was the urban heat island effect and the, the argument that uh, because we know that, so we, we know areas like Phoenix are much warmer than they were before the development of the, the urban area. And so much has been made of the uh, you know, measurements that would have come from Phoenix, and naturally they're going to show a warming trend. Uh, an incredible amount of effort has been put into the, the issue of clearing those potential biases in the record. Another important one that, that uh, he included was the, the different um, uh, records of, uh, satellite records of the Earth's surface temperature showed warming, while satellite records of the lower atmosphere showed cooling. And so this was also uh, a very important source of uncertainty. And one of the things that the community, the skeptics said, uh, you know, they, one says this, one says that. You can't make heads or tails of it. A lot of work has gone on in the last five years to address and to, and to actually understand what the sources of those differences were. And for example, in the satellite record, we know now that it was, a cali that it was calibration uh, uh, issues that had to do with the slowing of the, the speed of, trans of uh, motion of the satellite. So they're, they're honest problems. I look at them as challenges to the credibility of the science and the certainty. And they have to be taken on one by one because if, if it's not, uh, you know, if these aren't issues, if they aren't problems, then let's deal with it. Time for one last question, a short one, I hope. Sorry. No. Harold Loesch, oceanographer. Two questions concerning uh, the same thing, uh, Gulf Stream and uh, global warming. C could global warming shut down the Gulf Stream, and what would that do to Europe's warm climate? Number two, if it does shut down the Gulf Stream, what will that do to hurricanes in this area? OK. Um, the Gulf Stream is a surface current. So it is driven by winds. There is no evidence in any of the, the uh, models that, uh, that global warming or global climate change would change the overall circulation. So the Gulf Stream will just keep on trucking, whether it's warm or whether it's cooler, the Gulf Stream will be there. Uh, with respect to uh, hurricanes, the function of hurricanes in climate is to move heat from the tropics to the poles. And they're wonderful at it. They evaporate water. They store it. So that's stored heat in the atmosphere. They move to higher latitudes. They dump the water. That transfers the heat. That's why we have hurricanes. And so theoretically, if you have more heat to transport from the tropics to the poles, you will have either more hurricanes or you will have more intense hurricanes. For a lot of reasons that I'm not a physical oceanographer and I'm not a hurricane climatologist, but uh, theory predicts stronger 
hurricanes, not more hurricanes. Uh, and uh, that is why you saw such a hullabaloo about this after Katrina and Rita. And, the, and of course, we only have really good data on the oceans for the last 50 years. So we have lots of data on hurricanes, but it's the ocean data, and that was the source of the, all of the argument. Uh, were, were they saying that there were more hurricanes and stronger hurricanes based on an adequate data set? And the current conclusion of the hurricane community is that there is good evidence that in the last 50 years there have been more Category 4 and 5 hurricanes in the Northern Hemisphere, statistically more, uh, but there is not evidence that there have been more hurricanes. So that's where things stand now. Thank you.